Welcome to the MD Edge Daily News for Wednesday, July 18th. I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, better communication between ICU staff and families may improve end-of-life choices. Also today, there is a lack of safety data from randomized trials for probiotics. And later, intranasal naloxone is promising for type 1 hypoglycemia. But we begin today with the management of patients with HIV and diabetes. Now that HIV-positive patients are living almost as long as everyone else, physicians need to factor aging and, in many cases, diabetes into their strategy. This is according to Dr. Todd Brown, an endocrinologist at Johns Hopkins Hospital. It's not just a matter of subbing in an alternate drug here or there, he says. Patients with both HIV and diabetes require significant adjustments to diagnosis and treatment. MD Edge reporter Randy Dutinga spoke with Dr. Brown at the annual scientific sessions of the American Diabetes Association. For hyperlipidemia, this is really important. There's a lot of statins that interact with HIV medications. So this is something that uh, HIV practitioners need to know about in that the statins that we use, uh, typically the high potency statins, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, have important interactions with HIV medications, particularly protease inhibitors, such that you're limited in the doses that you can give, 20 milligrams max for atorvastatin, uh, 10 milligrams for rosuvastatin. And instead of going up to the highest dose, as the AHA ACC guidelines would suggest, and titrate down if they're a problem, I tend to titrate up, just because the interactions are unpredictable, whether or not you're going to get to someone that's going to have a lot of excess drug on board because of the drug-drug interactions that you see. That was Dr. Todd Brown of Johns Hopkins Hospital talking statins for HIV-positive patients with diabetes. You can see the full interview by clicking the link in the podcast description. A support intervention for the families of critically ill patients did nothing to ease their psychological symptoms, but the intervention, led by nurses, did improve family perception of staff communication and family-centered care in the ICU. The length of stay in the ICU was also significantly shorter, and the in-unit death rate was higher among patients whose families received the intervention. This suggests that difficult end-of-life choices may have been eased. The research was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Douglas White of the University of Pittsburgh and his colleagues randomly assigned more than 1,400 patients and their family surrogates in five different ICUs to receive either usual care or the multi-component family support intervention. The primary outcome was change in the family member's scores on the hospital anxiety depression scale at six months. Secondary outcomes included scores for post-traumatic stress and quality of communication. In the intervention groups, nurses met with families daily and also arranged regular meetings with ICU clinicians. Dr. White says that taken together, these findings suggest that the intervention allowed surrogates to transition a patient's treatment to comfort-focused care when doing so aligned with the patient's values. Adverse event data are often lacking or inadequate in clinical trials of probiotics and prebiotics, This makes it impossible to draw broad conclusions about the safety of interventions aimed at modifying gut microbiota. This is according to a review published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Researchers reviewed nearly 400 randomized clinical trials and report that nearly one-third of them did not include information on potential harms associated with probiotics or prebiotics or any product that combines the two. Out of 53 studies, including hospitalization or critical care patients, seven reported the number of serious adverse events per study group. The researchers note that when safety was reported, it was often inadequate. Generic safety statements were used in 37% of the randomized trials. Dr. Ida Befeta, an epidemiologist in Paris and the lead study author, says that the lack of safety information could lead to erroneous decision-making with major consequences for patients and the safety profile of an intervention should never be presumed. (music) 
finally today, intranasal naloxone might be just the thing to prevent hypoglycemia-associated autonomic failure. This is according to research presented at the annual scientific sessions of the American Diabetes Association. Hypoglycemia-associated autonomic failure, HOF for short, has been a clinical problem for a very long time, says Dr. Sandra Alexic of Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. She often sees a scenario where a patient is in her clinic with no symptoms, but has a blood sugar of 50 milligrams per deciliter. Endogenous opioids are partly to blame for HOF because hypoglycemia induces the release of beta endorphin, which then inhibits production of epinephrine. Researchers from Einstein have previously reported that in small studies, morphine blunts the response to induced hypoglycemia, and IV naloxone prevents HOF. But IV naloxone isn't practical for outpatients, so they wanted to try intranasal naloxone to see if they could achieve similar results. They used hypoglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamps to drop blood glucose levels to 54 milligrams per deciliter for two hours twice on one day in seven healthy participants. Then the researchers gave the participants hourly sprays of either intranasal saline or intranasal naloxone. Overall, there was no difference in peak epinephrine levels between the first hypoglycemic episode on day one and the third episode on day two in subjects who received naloxone, but the third episode placed placebo patients into HOF. Dr. Alexic says that acute self-administration of intranasal naloxone could be an effective real-world approach in type 1 diabetes. And that concludes the Wednesday edition of the MD Edge Daily News. You can find links to these stories in the podcast description. For MD Edge, I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm Nick Andrews. The MD Edge Sitecast is all new today with Dr. Leslie Citrome addressing tardive dyskinesia. The Sitecast is released every Wednesday. You can subscribe to the Sitecast, the Daily News, and all of our podcasts wherever podcasts are found.